McNamara, this is before he was before he was fired. He is being asked some very um, tough questions here. I'm going to um, let you guys, let's see, who's next to read? Um, it's, it's Tyler, isn't it? So Tyler, can you um, read this to us here? What What's being said? Just Mr. Abel or uh, McNamara? Well, it? let's do this. Let's have you be Mr. Abel and we'll have Dylan be uh, McNamara. All right. Secretary McNamara, it is three years this week since we started bombing North Vietnam. It was also in 65 that we started the big buildup on the ground. What happened this week? How do you relate the ability of the Viet Cong to stage as major and offensive as this one was to the efforts we have been making these past three years? Three years ago, or mayor exactly two and a half years ago, in July of 1965, President Johnson made the decision announced to our people the decision to move significant numbers of combat troops into South Vietnam. At that time, the North Vietnamese and their associates, the Viet Cong, were on the verge of cutting the country in half and destroying the South Vietnamese army. We said so at the time, and I think hindsight has proven that a correct appraisal. What has happened since then, since that time, of course, is that they have suffered severe losses they have failed in their objective to destroy the government of South Vietnam. They have failed in their objective to take control of the country. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, they have continued to fight just four days ago. I remember reading in our press that I presented a gloomy, pessimistic picture of activities in South Vietnam. I don't think it was, I don't think it was gloomy or pessimi pessimistic. It was realistic. It said that while they had suffered severe penalties, they continued to have strength to carry out the attacks, which we have seen in the last two or three days. Mr. Secretary, are you telling me, uh, are you telling us the fact that the Viet Cong, after all these years, uh, well, yeah, after all these years, were able to temporarily, at least, grab control of some twenty odd pro uh, provincial. I can't think today. Provincial, it, provincial. <laughs> capitals and the city of Saigon. Are you telling us this has no military meaning at all? No, certainly not. I think South Vietnam is such a com complex situation, one must always look at the pluses and the minuses. I don't mean to say that there haven't been any minuses for the South Viet Vietnamese in the last several days. I think there have been, but there have been many, many pluses. In the, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong have not accomplished either one of their major objectives either to ignite a general uprising or to force a diversion of troops with the South Vietnamese and the United <coughs> States have moved in the northern areas of South Vietnam, anticipating a major Viet Cong and North Vietnamese offensive in that area. And beyond that, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong have suffered heavy, very heavy penalties in terms of losses of weapons and losses of men in the past several days. They have, of course, dealt a very heavy blow to many of the cities in South Vietnam. Yes, we're almost here, and let me, I'm going to stop you guys here. Basically, what's going on here is they're being, he's being pressed, right? He's being pressed to say, okay, you guys have said it's, hopefully you said it's gloomy, and now, come on, I mean, what do you think, you know, um, right? Looking at this big conflict, let me take advantage of your valedictory mood. If we had to do it all over again, would you make any changes? And McNamara cuts him off and says, hey, this is not an appropriate time to be talking about hindsight. There is no question but 5, 10, 20 years from now, historians will find actions that might have been done differently, right? Um, I do not by any means suggest that we have not made mistakes over the many years we've been pursuing these objectives, but he's still trying to say, hey, we, we're still doing what we need to be doing. At the very end, this is auspicious. He says, I don't think any of us predicted 70 years ago or 15 years ago the deployment of 500,000 men to Vietnam. I know I didn't. Um, I invite you all to take a look at a movie. It's called The Fog of War, right? And it's um, the 11 life lessons of um, Robert Strange McNamara. And this is him, him reflecting on the war and his other... Um, his other career um, hallmarks, I wouldn't necessarily call them achievements in the way it's presented. Um, take a look at that because he eventually recants. He goes from being what's called a hawk to a dove. Um, Clark Kifford, on the other hand, and I'm again, I'm trying to move quickly here. He 
is recalling on how he shifted, how he went from being totally for the war to trying to persuade Johnson to de-escalate. And he's saying, well, we asked a bunch of questions. It's not possible to recall all the answers and um, you know, the call and response. He says, basically, I ultimately reached the conclusion those days of exhausting scrutiny. The principal issues raised, it says, what, you know, what is it going to take to win this war? 200,000 more men do the job? I found no assurance they would. If not, how many more might be needed and when? There was no way of knowing. What would be involved in committing 200,000 more, 200, more men to Vietnam? A reverse call-up of approximately 280,000, increased draft, extension of out tours of duty. Can the enemy respond with a buildup of his own? He could and probably would. What are the estimated costs of the latest requests? And he starts going through, right, and um, I'll send you these documents. You can read on your own. Can bombing stop the war? Never by itself. Will stepping up the bombing decrease American casualties? He starts methodically taking apart these uh, really straw men of reasons to continue the war, right? And he boldly, and, and uh, now history is, has <laughs> labeled him as such, that it was a very bold move for him to say, hey, given these circumstances, how can we win? Right? We would, as I told, continue to evidence our superiority over the enemy. We'd continue to attack in the belief he'd reached the stage where he would find it inadvisable to go on with the war. He could not afford the attrition we are inflicting on him. We we're improving our posture any time. But there was no light at the end of the tunnel. There was no way to say this was going to work, and so the conclusion of this document, right? After these exhausting days, I was convinced the military course we were pursuing was not only endless, but hopeless. Not only endless, but hopeless. Further substantial increase in American forces would only increase devastation and Americanization of the war, thus leave us even further from our goal of peace. Our primary goal should be to level off involvement and work towards a gradual disengagement. Well, how do you stop this train from rolling, right? And this, right, look at the date here. This is exactly two months after Tet. Johnson takes this bold step, right? He gives a televised national address announcing that he is not going to re-elect himself. He's not going to try and seek the presidency for a second term. This is crazy. This may not seem like much to you guys now, but this this at the time was like sucker punch to the Democratic Party, right? Nobody saw this coming. And um, I will spare you my Texan accent <laughs> and not read it as such, but um, instead, whose turn is it? Tyler, can you read this to us? Sure. With America's sons in the fields far away, with America's future under challenge right here at home, with our hopes and the world's hopes for peace and the balance every day, I do not believe that I should devote an hour or a day of my time to any personal partisan causes or to any duties other than the awesome duties of this office, the presidency of your country. Accordingly, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. That was crazy talk at the time, right? 1968, March 31st, 1968, April 4th, Right. Let's back up a second. A April April fourth, nineteen sixty eight. Martin Luther King is killed. Right. Um, then you have these riots at the Democratic National Convention. Right. Um, Hubert Humphrey accepts the Democratic nomination for the presidency. These anti-war demonstrators outside the convention. The police are breaking them up with tear gas and billy clubs and rubber bullets. And this, everyone is looking at this, thinking, what? What is America all about? Are you kidding me? Like, the all civility is lost. We're supposed to be this democracy, and there's madness in the streets, and why? Right? There's, the con there's this huge uh, crisis of confidence. Into the vacuum comes Richard Milhouse Nixon. He is the Republican candidate. He is going to figure very prominently in our discussions of the bombing of Cambodia. So remember this guy's face, right? Uh, he won the election in 1968, a very thin margin, but he's com he uh, claimed to have the backing of a, quote, silent majority, right? And these are people who, this is a generational split now. 
um, and a regional split too. You have to see small town America um, is appalled by these protests. They can't stand the hippies. They don't like the lawlessness. They don't like this cultural movement away from World War II, suburbia, very predictable, white picket fence, um, traditional roles for white uh, Anglo-Saxon Protestant America, really. That was this is the you know the prescription, and then these hippies in the street, this biracial dating, this having sex out of wedlock, these girls on the birth control pill, which had just become legal, burning your bras, burning the draft cards. Right, this is shocking to Middle America, and Middle America is who elected Richard Nixon. He claims to have a secret plan to win the war in Vietnam. Right, can't tell anybody what it is because uh, then the enemy will know. And he becomes part of the presidential domino. Um, did it was it lost on his watch? Um, that is an interesting question because you know he had to resign in disgrace after he was impeached for the uh, Watergate tapes, which is a uh, Watergate break-in and then the and then the um, you know illegality surrounding that issue. He was a very interesting character. Um, he twice widened the war in his strategy to end it. And he authorized secret bombing and invasions of Cambodia and Laos. His policies triggered chaos and eventual genocide in Cambodia, which um, is super important to see. And you guys will get more of that in the next unit. Basically, um, he listened and relied very heavily on um, Henry Kissinger, and Lee Duck To was the uh, Henry Kissinger equivalent of the Vietnamese side, right? And these diplomatic process were started um, quietly. Meanwhile, Nixon was very fond of what he called the madman theory, which was be so radical with your military, you know, so over the top with it that your enemy doesn't just think, oh man, he's got his finger on the nuclear button. We don't know what this crazy guy is going to do, so maybe we better negotiate. Um, American casualties during the Nixon era nearly doubled from the previous three presidential administrations combined. And that is a very important piece of information because um, as the casualties increased, so did the protests at home. So it is here that we will pause one moment, and I will... Um, send you back to our essential questions and we can see if we can answer them. Um, do, let's see, where are we here? So let's review these briefly and we'll get you on your merry way. Um, why was 1968 a landmark year for the war in Vietnam and its impact in America? In your own words, Dylan, what do you think? Um, I guess it's because uh, it's where like all started, all all the conflicts like started to spark, I guess. Especially okay. with like the media in terms of the media versus like the government, what the government was actually um, revealing to like the citizens. Good stuff. Okay, so uh, Ted Offensive, why? What was it, and why was it so significant, Nick? Um. Well, it was the when the um. The people attacked the base and took over the base, uh, the American uh, base for a month, right? Well, yeah, they attacked a hundred cities overnight, a hundred all at once, and then of course they held on to Hue, which was um, the the main battle, and they held on to the Saigon Embassy. So why was this so significant? You can kind of bundle the next question in this if. Um, Right? Uh, it was so significant because it affected U.S. policy towards Vietnam. Um, let's see here. Reese, what, how did the Vietnamese civilians experience the U.S. response to Tet? Has Reese left the building? Do we have you left? <laughs> All right. Uh, that, recall this is the this is the woman who was uh, living in Hue. The, the Americans responded with this overwhelming firepower, and then you've got the civilians caught in the middle, right? Um, who won the Tet Offensive? Tyler, what do you think? Who won? No, we can't hear you. Sorry. Um, 
Tyler, who won the Tet Offensive and what role did the media play in that? Sorry, had myself muted. Uh, yeah. Well, I would say that the uh, Viet Cong won the Tet Offensive. Yeah. Um, and what do you think? How did the media contribute to that conclusion? Well, since it was such a large scale attack, uh, the media uh, portrayed it as so. And like you said earlier, the. Uh, War is fought in the hearts and minds and the living wounds of uh, millions of homes in the U.S. mainland. So uh, they saw the uh, grand scale of this attack and their morale diminished as a result. Nicely done, right? It totally shifted American opinion. People who were kind of like, uh, I don't know about that weird war that's going on over there. Yeah, there's people coming home in body bags, but this was the, all of a sudden it was like, oh, wait a minute, our government's lying to us, right? This is the World War II generation who had grown up believing that you, you know, my country right or wrong, I'm going to serve, I do what they, you know, Uncle Sam calls and you go, and they're seeing what's happening on television, they're finding out that their comrades are coming back with PTSD and saying, hey man, NOM isn't what you think it is. And, um, right, so this, this ends up affecting popular culture in America. You see it in the, in the music, you see it in the civil rights movement, and then you ultimately see it as it influences the, um, you know, the, they say that the final domino, right, in the domino theory, the final domino is, is the presidential office itself. So Johnson's removal from the presidential race, this has an effect on the Vietnam War, and I know you guys don't learn, haven't learned quite as much about this as you will um, shortly. But just off the top of your heads, um, and I'm going to conclude with you, Tyler, because you're at the end of my list here. How did U.S. policy toward Vietnam shift within the presidential uh, shift in presidential administrations when we changed from? Johnson to Nixon. How did the policy shift? Do you remember? I do. Uh, well, Johnson was a bit more conservative, and uh, but uh, Nixon had, like you said, the uh, like the madman theory, where you uh, you know basically you throw everything at the Viet Cong. So like the public didn't know about these secret bombings in Laos and Cambodia, but uh, Nixon authorized these uh, invasions and excursions in Cambodia and Laos.